I hope that meditation was helpful for you. And if you came in part way, uh, the introduction that I offered had to do with the emphasis on steadiness of mind, uh, emphasis coming both from the Buddha 2,500 years ago and modern psychologists who have studied resilience and what, what helps us to cope and to recover, including from the worst day of our life. Uh, a fundamental stability, which includes the stability of attention and the sense of wholeness in the present with grounding. And in meditation, we can cultivate that. And I offered a variety of ways to do that. Um, to repeat the uh, teaching from the Buddha, if one comes to a river swollen and swiftly flowing and is swept along, how can one help others across? And that teaching is relevant both for deepening and strengthening meditation and also for the talk I'd like to give now about uh, dealing with really the hard things in life. Uh, and uh, this talk was um, spurred by an email, a, a note I actually I received in the uh, chat, I think, from a um, uh, week ago. And feel the weight of it as I read it. I was recently diagnosed with breast cancer and a six-year journey of aggressive treatment planned by doctors. Many people are facing life-threatening health crises, including long-term COVID-19 harm. Facing no longer existing is so strange. All we know is the experience of existing. This is where the rubber really hits the road in our Buddhist path. The reality via the diagnosis of impermanence. The groundlessness of life-threatening disease and being immunocompromised in the age of COVID and in 19 and its variants. All of us would be deeply grateful for a talk about living courageously, fully, and in peace with, and possibly dying from, illness and its accompanying pain. I want to repeat the sentence, facing no longer existing is really strange. I was very touched when I read that, and I want to say to the person who wrote it to me, thank you for sharing it. Also, uh, recently I've had a dear friend um, die um, after a um, seven-month struggle with cancer, diagnosed on his 70th birthday. And you too, if you're like many of the people who've written me in the chats and elsewhere, uh, you too have are going through difficulties, are facing loss, illness, aging, and death, as we all are. What to do about it all? Uh, you may know the teaching story, perhaps true, perhaps not, but it's a good teaching story about the Buddhist life that as a young and privileged, privileged man, protected from much of life's difficulties, even 2,500 years ago, one day he encountered four, as they are called, heavenly messengers, teachers, all four of them, messengers of wisdom coming revealed to him. The first one was someone who was sick, someone who was very ill. The second divine messenger was someone who was very old and infirm. The third divine messenger was a corpse, someone who was dead all messengers, teachings. And the fourth heavenly messenger was someone who was deeply engaged in psycho-spiritual practice, four heavenly messengers. And it's kind of remarkable, and I think such a acknowledgement, at least in my view, of the, the Buddha Dharma, that old age, disease, and death are considered to be messengers from realms of wisdom. How can we practice with these messengers? How can we take them into account? Inevitably, uh, in a long life, a long good life, a privileged life, an advantaged life, we will all encounter 
the heavenly messengers of loss, frustration, uh, illness. If we're lucky, aging, and unavoidably and inevitably for all of us, our own death and either during our life or knowing it to come in the future, the death of all those we love. It's real. No way around it. <laughs> no escape from it. It's it's happening. It's it's really real. And um, so I want to offer five suggestions, really, from the Buddha Dharma, uh, you know, kind of infused with my own take, maybe, about how we can practice with this. The first practice, of course, is compassion. Compassion with its combination of clear seeing and empathy for what is true and the suffering broadly related to it. Empathy plus benevolence, not indifference, not neutrality, but benevolence, caring, tender concern, sympathy, support, with the movement to help if we can. That's compassion. So we bring compassion to the suffering around us and others, and we can bring compassion, and we should bring compassion to our own suffering as well. We don't turn away from it. I asked a teacher of mine, uh, someone I respect a lot, Gil Fronstel, who uh, teaches in the Peninsula area just south of San Francisco. I asked him once what he did in his own practice. It's a good question for anyone, really, especially someone who's pretty far along. What do you do in your own practice, Gil? He paused and with kind of a characteristic smile, he said, I stop for suffering. His own and other people's. I stop for suffering. So we can stop for suffering. We can honor it. We can face it, not run away from it, not medicate around it. I mean, in terms of drugs and alcohol, and, you know, not, not turn away from it, but just face it. Like, yeah, it's real. Uh, I spent uh, probably, I spent part of his last day with him, with my, with my friend, and he was unresponsive, my friend who eventually died, and um, breathing in a pretty labored way. There was some IV pain medication going into him, unresponsive largely. Um, and I watched him, and it, it really looked like he was falling asleep, slowly but surely, into a very deep sleep. And I thought to myself, dying is very natural. It is. Sometimes it's sudden and sometimes it's tragic. But eventually, dying is completely natural. And it's a very big deal. <laughs> Looking at my friend, I thought dying is natural and a big deal. It was a big deal for me, and it was a really big deal for him, even though he had an incredibly deep, remarkable, and courageous wellspring of spiritual practice as he faced his own death, uh, inspiring to so many other people, including myself. So dying's a big deal. Illness is a big deal. Being wounded by other people, feeling betrayed by family members or your countrymen, country beings, country men and women, country people. Um, it's all a big deal. It's a big deal to get laid off. It's a big deal to struggle financially. It's a big deal to be targeted for rape by racism or sexism or other forms of structural injustice and oppression. These are big deals. It's a big deal to look at your planet inexorably, predictably heating up based on greenhouse gases being routinely daily expelled by human activity. A hundred um, million tons a day of CO2 are ejected into the atmosphere every day due to human activity. Uh, half of which, half of that CO2 stays up in the sky. The other quarter lands in the ocean, and another quarter is roughly absorbed by plants. Uh, it's a lot, inevitably. It's a big deal. And it's okay to have compassion about it. It's okay to have compassion alongside other related feelings of fury about it or fieriness about it, hopefully without hatred and helplessness and despair invading your heart. And interestingly, compassion does help to buffer us from hatred, helplessness, and despair. So the first practice 
is compassion. It's the first practice. <laughs> it's the in-between practice. It's the last practice of all as we take our own last breath, compassion. Second, action. If there's action to take, practical action. Dealing with illness, look for good doctors, look for good medical professionals. Um, don't accept just the first thing you hear. Get a second opinion, get a third opinion. Bang the drum. Uh, reach out for support. Uh, if appropriate, talk to a lawyer about a different kind of an issue. You know, talk with your friends. Figure out your plan, if only inside your own mind. Know that you're doing what you can. It doesn't mean that you're doing everything you can in every moment, but in a sustainable way, there's no replacement for skillful action. If you look at a lot of the Buddha Dharma, it's about skill. Pardon me. It's about skillful means of different kinds. Uh, there's no replacement for taking action, and you'll feel better as you face various difficulties, including with other people. You'll feel better if you've taken the actions that you can. You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, I imagine sometimes when I'm in a tricky conversation <laughs> that there's a video camera in the corner of the room, uh, not unlike the one right in front of me here, but more like in the corner of the room, uh, just recording what I'm doing, what I'm saying. And, you know, how do we want to be in such a way that if that recording is played at your kid's wedding, uh, your own retirement party or the Board of Psychology or your own memorial, maybe, after you've passed away. Uh, how do you want to feel about what's being recorded there? You know, do you want to feel pretty good about it? You might wince occasionally. I would wince myself, uh-oh, occasionally. But can you generally feel good? Yeah, I did what I could. Head high, self-respect, bliss of blamelessness. Take action. That's the second practice. The third practice is summarized in this Zen story, call it a koan, from the great teacher Unman. And Unman was asked once, what is it that trees wither and leaves fall? What is it? He replied, body exposed in the golden wind. Like so many Zen teachings, there are levels and depths even beyond my own understanding of this, of this teaching. Uh, for me, there's the recognition that if we are to live, we must be exposed to the winds. In Tibetan Buddhism, there are the worldly winds, so-called the worldly winds of pleasure and pain, gain and loss, praise and blame, fame and ill repute. Um, we must live exposed. We live dependently. Uh, we live dangled by 10,000 vulnerable threads in any moment. That's the nature of our being. That's the nature of all being, all life, all animals, including big complicated animals like us. We are that tree. We are the body, exposed, vulnerable, frail, fragile, Still here, meanwhile, in the golden wind, both the golden wind of autumn and harvest and celebration and thanksgiving and icy, wintry winds of mistreatment by others, loss, physical pain, illness, injustice that is not remedied in our life. We are exposed to so many winds, and that's what's necessary to live, to be at all, body exposed in the golden wind. And can we open our heart? Can we soften the body? Can we, can we feel more vulnerable? Can we accept our inherent interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh puts it, amidst the winds of all kinds in this life? Can we soften and accept that in Quit fighting it. <laughs> My dad, 
Born on a ranch in North Dakota in 1918, very rational, practical North Dakota rancher person who got interested in animals and fish and game, became a scientist and a zoologist. Uh, he said to me once that he thought this Buddhism stuff was pretty interesting for other people. And to summarize a lot of material, knowing that my dad was an ecologist, he was a specialist in birds and population ecology, and he modeled the rise and fall of different populations of animals mathematically. And I said to him once uh, in response to what he said there, well, dad, you know, basically Buddhism is about recognizing two truths, that everything's connected and everything's changing. And recognizing that if we align with that, we kind of get with that program, you know, ride the river in the direction it's going, then we suffer less and we create less harm for ourselves and others. And yet if we resist those two truths, of interconnectedness and impermanence, ugh, then we create a lot of suffering and harm. And he was nodding along. And I said, so dad, you know, as a professor of ecology, you've been a Buddhist all along. You just didn't know it. <laughs> and he, he nodded. He didn't have much to say to that. And I thought, score one <laughs> for me. <laughs> in a good way, in a good way, in a good way. My dad and I were very close. So, um, my mom and my mom and I too. So anyway, yeah, okay. Body exposed in the golden wind, you know. Face the reality of that. Face the facts. Uh, there's this recorded teaching from Thich Nhat Han that uh, my wife and I listen to sometimes, and in his incredibly soft, sweet, penetrating, no bull kind of voice, he says, "Nothing is permanent. Nothing." is permanent. <laughs> you know, I can hear that that voice in my ear right now as I say it. So, um, you know, if we are to live, we we must recognize that all experiences are empty. Everything is passing. All phenomena are passing. It's grip it's running through our fingers as it occurs. We cannot hold on to it. It's there's nothing to hold on to because we can't if we try to essentialize things or hold on to them, we immediately suffer. What we must do is recognize and embrace the truth of exposure, of vulnerability, of being falling back continuously into the golden wind, continuously disappearing beneath our feet while being continuously renewed. That's the third practice, living exposed in the golden wind. The fourth practice is to have courage. That's given in the person who wrote me, who talks about how can we live courageously, fully, and at peace amidst illness and, and possibly a terminal diagnosis, as well as other challenges and other heavenly messengers in this life. How can we live courageously? Courage. So I want to flag courage as the fourth practice. Courage. Life contains pain. There are pains we can avoid, including the pains that we create ourselves through unskillful practice that we can learn about and gradually heal and transform. That said, there is still inescapable pain. And for many people, there's a lot, a lot of pain. We can have courage in how we face it. We can know that while we must endure pain, we need not be defined by pain. And we can know, except at those most horrible and most overwhelming moments, but most of the rest of the time, even with grievous pain, we can know and remain in contact with a refuge inside everyone, deep down inside, that itself is at peace. Itself, this core of being, Buddha nature, deep within us all, this core of being is not invaded and occupied and possessed by pain. It stands apart from the pain. It witnesses it. It has it in some sense. 
but it is not identified with the pain. There is this place inside us all, perhaps, as I believe, partaking in some ways of a kind of infinite, timeless, unconditioned ground of being. That's the ground of the ground of all. If we lack the courage to face the, what the Buddha called the first arts of life directly, if we want to swerve away from them and fight with them and argue against them, we just add more darts. Those are the second darts we throw ourselves. We can have the courage, really, to bear inevitable pain. There may be pain. It will not last forever. Nothing is permanent. There's a place for a certain stoicism where you know, and I've had my times, they've not been as severe as those of many people, but I've had my own times where I knew that I just needed to do something. It was gonna be painful. It was gonna be hard. It was gonna be scary. I was really not gonna like it, but I had to do it. Maybe I had to say that thing to another person, or I made, or maybe I had to let go of that possibility, or maybe I had to go through that medical procedure, or maybe I had to you know, sit there <laughs> for the five or 10 seconds while they shoved that swab deep, deep, deep up my nose. Yeah. And even more intense things than that. And you know, it's not gonna go away, whatever we need to do, the pain is not gonna go away, the, the necessity is not gonna be any less. If we, moan and groan about it, moan and groan for a while. I have, <laughs> you know. And then there's a moment where, call it stoicism, call it resignation, call it courage, where you just reach out and you grasp the, the nestle. You say, okay, do it. I gotta do it. Here we go. And you do it. And have the courage to do it. No way around it. Courage. We can cultivate courage off stage, beforehand. But in the moment, we just take a breath and we do it. We feel the fear, we feel everything. We know what we need to do. <sighs> courage is in a sense surrendering to what you really need to do. That's courage. Find courage. Encourage yourself. Be in touch with the heart. Bring heart to it and do whatever you need to do. So that's the fourth practice, courage. And it's interesting that it is, there are stories from the Buddha's last days when he was um, seriously ill, he had a, probably a food infection of some kind, food poisoning of some kind, some kind of gastrointestinal crud, really unpleasant stuff. And by all accounts, he maintained his own equanimity, which is certainly a factor of courage, his own inner balance. It was pain. There were first starts, no doubt about it. And in all of that, he maintained his courage. And then last uh, in my list here, I'm sure there's more one could say. This is what I will say. Fifth, be grateful. It may seem counterintuitive or bogus to find gratitude in the midst of the worst days of your life. Yes, I get it, I get it. And I'm not talking about using gratitude to deny or dismiss or bypass um, the hard things, including the hard things that maybe you're experiencing deep down inside. But it's really helpful. Actually, it's a resource. It helps us cope with hard things to realize that these hard things um, are happening as part of a vast collection of factors and experiences, many of which we can be very, very grateful for. Most people today, certainly, have had many, many good things happen in their life, most of which were quite small and brief in the flow of everyday life, and yet they we're worthy of gratitude. Uh, I think of every day, you know, it's like walking on a path. 
So we walk over the path of our day. And strewn along that path are hundreds of ordinary jewels, little pearls, emeralds, rubies, sapphires, and diamonds scattered before us. We often don't even notice them. We just step over them, boom, boom, boom. You know, got that done, ate that food, turned a faucet, fresh water, flushed a toilet, flipped a switch, listened to some music, talked to a friend, got another thing done, uh, tasted something nice, smelled something nice, looked out, beauty. Uh, in this moment, no one's you know, firing a weapon at me, at least in this moment. A lot of little moments, all kinds of things around us created by other people to help life keep on working, sidewalks. Uh, there was a crew outside my house this morning from our local water utility to fix something in the street in front of my home. Three guys standing there. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Appreciate it. So many things we can be grateful for, we can appreciate. And, you know, if you look back in your life altogether, even if you're facing perhaps the last year or month or day, what can you be grateful for? What can you respect as what you've been given? We're grateful for gifts. What are the gifts you've been given, right? So many people, so many beauties, the gift of life itself, so many animals who've died so that you and I may live. So many people who have worked hard over 300,000 years of the human species so far in various ways to help bring us to this point. Wow, thank you. Almost everyone, certainly me included, almost everyone living today has had a, a generally wonderful wild ride. And it's quite something to look back and consider it that way. What a wonderful, wild, weird ride. <laughs> At the end of my book, Neurodharma, um, I have a sentence there toward the very, very end in the last chapter. I think it goes, it's strange, isn't it, this life? You live and love, and then you leave. It's, it's a wild ride. It's totally weird. And, wow, wow, thank you. And to be able to have, and to be able to have had that wonderful, weird, wild ride, we must unavoidably live exposed to all of the winds. It's the price of entry. It's the ticket we buy. And netting it all out, netting it all out, can you not be grateful, mainly grateful, for what you've received and appreciative also for what you've given? Part of gratitude, in effect, is for previous use. We can be grateful because we've received the gifts today from the you we were yesterday. We can be grateful. Today's a Wednesday in North America where I am. We can be grateful for Tuesday's you. Tuesday's Rick, Tuesday's Sarah, Tuesday's Tom, Tuesday's Tracy, Tuesday's Mark and Ken, yesterday's you. And then the you before that, and the you before that, and the you before that, stretching all the way back to the little you you were on the day you were born. And you looked around and you went, what the? We can be grateful to all those previous yous who've enabled this wild, weird, and wonderful life. And this fifth practice of gratitude is a blessing in and of itself. And boy, is it an important resource in grappling with hard things in life, including loss, illness, aging, and death. Okay. So lots and lots of comments and questions have come in on, through the chat. 
you should know that I read everything always. I typically do so after the formal end here because I can't possibly read everything. You know, this come up, come along the way and still give my talk with any coherence in it. I will see it. Um, I can just take a little look. So I'll repeat the five practices. Uh, compassion. Practical action. Understanding that we live exposed to the golden winds. Recognizing impermanence, emptiness, vulnerability, interdependence. <sighs> Bringing wisdom. That's the third practice. Call that wisdom. And then fourth, courage. Courage, including the stoic courage that just gets through the breath, gets through the day. Vidyamala Birch, someone I respect immensely who deals with really serious chronic pain, um, had a really turning point for herself early uh, in her journey of pain as a young woman in the hospital after yet another problematic operation and a terrible pain, forced to lie still. Ah, ah, good. <laughs> anyway, Vidyamala was lying there and had no idea how she could possibly get through the next day or year. It's terrible. And then she realized that all she needed to get through was this moment. This moment. And she found the courage in herself to be able to do that moment after moment breath after breath. That's courage. And then last, the fifth, is gratitude. Gratitude as context, gratitude not as denial, gratitude as appreciating the wild, weird, wacky, and wonderful life uh, that this is. Whew, what a ride. Oh, with all the good and all the bad, what a ride. Uh, and to have this ride, we must live exposed to the golden winds. So those are the five practices. Okay. So maybe one or two people would like to talk with me. I see Zoom user. So as as usual, I, I don't I can't recall, I think you may have spoken up before. You probably know. I asked that you have a succinct question and that you, so I've asked you to unmute, a succinct question that's focused on a general topic of interest, and uh, and I'll try to be brief in my reply. Okay, <laughs> your turn. So, um, sorry. Sure. Um, no worries. I'm the woman who, uh, who wrote you the message. Oh, wow. Um. So, um, it's it's really the last thing I want to ask you about, which is um, um, uh, I um. It's a challenge to have gratitude. I focus on um, uh, uh, my cowardice where I have um, not taken the, brought, made things for my life, mm. love, relation, certain relationships. Yeah. Um, It's tough. Well, if I hear you right, first, let me just say, I so appreciate you speaking up and I so appreciate the note you wrote, man. Also, I, I just really feel for you, you know? Um, and if I hear you right further, 
part of what's coming up is regret, right? Yeah. And that's really natural. And it's also natural to, when I name these five practices, to realize that some make more sense at other times than others. Like compassion makes sense, especially in the very beginning. It's also helpful throughout, but as an immediate response, compassion is really supportive. And gratitude for life altogether may, may come in later. There can also be gratitude for what is good in the present. There's a little summary of practice you've probably heard me say. I'll just repeat it for others. Uh, deal with the bad, turn to the good, take in the good. One, two, three. And we deal with the bad, but also we can turn to the good. Meanwhile, the, the physicians, the care providers, you know, medical medicine today is so much better than it was 20 years ago, including for breast cancer, for example. And there are things we can be grateful for. You know, the the Mr. Rogers line about look for look to the helpers. So those those are forms of gratitude that can be helpful to us. With regard to the regrets, you know, are you? Um, yeah, that's a big one because there's no, yeah, there's the you know the turns we took and we look back and wish we hadn't, or the turns we wish we had taken, love, other things, you know, and I think whether it's in the process of the lifespan in general or accelerated with a potentially terminal diagnosis, um, there's a there's a you know a normal process of looking hard at, at life and in a clear-eyed way going, you know, whew, made some mistakes in retrospect, or had some bad luck too, or got mistreated. I think all those are in the mix. Often a combination, you know, bad luck, mistreatment, uh, mistakes, and and sometimes it's important to realize. I think that we make the choices we do often because of how we were raised or the vision of what was possible that we grew up with. I've I've faced that myself, certainly in terms of career choices in particular. Things just didn't seem possible to me, so I didn't pursue them and. Actually, I know now that they actually were possible, but no one told me so. You know, things. So you, there is an element of other forces that can sometimes be helpful to appreciate. Yeah. I think there's a place for mourning, for grieving, and feeling it. And there's no timetable that's given in some book somewhere about how long it should take. Sometimes it seems like you're done with it, but then another bigger wave hits you. Whoa. You know, and and I think the wisdom is to is to let it flow through you. You know, when I was dealing with my, my father's last months, um, and every day was just nuts for all kinds of reasons, including, you know, family reasons. Uh <laughs> I just started imagining myself as like kelp sitting on the surface of a stormy sea, you know, intense w waves, winds pouring through, and the kelp is shaken, and yet it doesn't resist anything, and it's still here when it gets a little calmer. So that's how we can be with waves of grief, and regret, you know. And then I think, I don't know, I've, I haven't been through what you're going through. You know, I've, I've known people who've been through it. Uh, really. And I've been through milder kind of sort of thing. So I just offer what I'm saying here diffidently, you know, with a lot of respect. Um, but I think there's a point where we just basically, we look and we go, you know, it was what it was. A uh, lot of good <laughs> in the mix, <laughs> you know. Uh, I did a lot of good things. I made choices for different reasons. I got those regrets. No one gets gets out of this life without regrets. If you haven't, if you don't have regrets in this life, you don't have a large enough heart and a large enough view, uh, really. Uh, and you know, that's that. Um, you know, my friend, my friend Terry, when he got his diagnosis on his birthday, 
well, seven months ago, his 70th birthday, uh, he said that he realized there after the shock wore off in the hospital, to his surprise on his birthday, rushed to the ER. Uh, when the shock wore off, he just realized that he had been, he said it more succinctly and better, that he had basically been preparing to have a certain kind of a life and that was over. That that game, in quotes, air quotes, had been called. That was over. <laughs> now he was in a whole other story, a whole other movie, a whole other chapter, a whole other thing. And he and I think there's a place for just taking a breath and going, you know, whatever was was, and I'm going to learn um, the lessons I can from it, and they're going to put on my tombstone. She lived until she died. She lived with a whole heart. She lived with a whole heart until she died. I hope they put it on my tombstone. He lived until he died. That's all we can do. The past is not here. The deep teaching of the Buddha, let go of the past. Let go of the future. Let go of the present as it dissolves beneath your feet. And find, therefore, the timeless, unconditioned, where death can find no hold. Let go of the past, let go of the future, let go of the present, and find the timeless, unconditioned, where death has no hold. For the rest of this mortal existence, And meanwhile, you know, if I could just offer one last thing here, um, partly it's kind of an intuition of you. You know, you have love. I think some of the sorrow is that it's like we don't have recipients for our love. And okay, yes, and meanwhile, we can love. Meanwhile, we can bring kindness, compassion, not to deny our own needs at all, but just to live with a loving heart, really, to live with a loving heart, to be transfigured by love. The Buddha taught that love was a, a, a holy, um, complete practice for full awakening. Yeah. Love can be like a current living through you, lifting you, li living through you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I suggest we all just sit for the last few couple minutes here. I won't talk anymore. Let's just be quiet together. And if you like, you can join me in extending warm wishes, compassion, blessing, respect to you, Zoom user, and also to other beings who are suffering, maybe some that you know. Let's just kind of rest in compassion and kindness for the last couple minutes here. And then I'll ring the bell three times and we'll come to a formal end.
May you not suffer. May you be at peace. May you rest in a loving heart.